So Rawdon told you at the beginning that there was a little ray of hope and it was the UK and I was going to tell you about it. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and you also, I guess, some of you came here hoping you were going to learn something. Well, again, I'm sorry, because we actually just don't know how Brexit is going to turn out. Um, I actually had uh, planned to talk about rather smaller and parochial matters in the WTO context than the grand role of what role Britain might play in uh, the WTO in, in uh, 20 years' time, and to ask, essentially, what impact is Brexit going to have on the WTO and its operations over the next uh, three or four years? Um, but as I said, I don't know. We have no idea what form the government thinks Brexit should take, if the government knows. And so, in a sense, this is um, all uh, largely uh, speculation. So, think about the shock. Um, Britain leaves the EU, common market and the single market. Uh, great shock, huge shock in Britain. Um, not yet recognized, I suspect, how large it is. It's a moderately big shock uh, for the EU. Uh, Britain's 15% of the EU, and it's a threat to the institutions. It's a, a real uh, sort of wake-up call, if you like. But how large is this shock in terms of the world? It actually isn't huge in terms of the world. You know, the IMF in solidarity with the then British government, shaved 1.1 or 0.2% of its growth rates for the UK over the next few years. But basically, uh, you know, the world is going to manage uh, with Brexit uh, as well as it uh, managed uh, without Brexit, with one exception, and that is if Brexit somehow starts to break up, change behaviour and uh, break up uh, the institutions. And you know, the point I really want to make in this is if we're careful and we're sensible, by that I basically mean if the British government is careful and sensible, but with a bit of cooperation from our friends, you know, we can, the world certainly can survive this crisis for Britain uh, perfectly well. If we're not careful, then indeed uh, we could uh, create uh, quite a problem. So the sort of working assumption that I'm going to make is that Britain is indeed going to leave the European Customs Union and that it is indeed going to get leave or get thrown out of the single market. Uh, essentially, if we look at the politics, it seems that the predominant view of the people who voted for Brexit is we must take control and we must control our borders. That means reduce migration. Um, taking control means that we want to be able to change something, and if we're in the customs union, we can't have our own trade policy. If we're in the single market, we can't have our own regulations. And migration, uh, the free mov movement of labor, is one of the four principles on which the EU is predicated, and it seems very unlikely that the EU would allow any significant uh, reduction in the free movement, and yet still allow Britain to benefit from all the rest of what the single market uh, can offer. So I think, frankly, we are going to be in a world where Britain is on its own um, as a trading nation. It will have trading relations. It will have trade deals, FTAs probably, with Europe and uh, with other countries. Um, and it will be, uh, as it were, sort of struggling to keep its place in some of the global value chains. Um, so. What changes in behavior might this set of circumstances um, uh, create? Um, it is true that the world trading system, the WTO, will be much more important to Britain than it ever was. Uh, Britain has been quite a strong advocate, actually, of the WTO and a liberal trading order, and has acted, actually, to move the EU in a rather more liberal direction on the whole. Uh, that's uh, a bit of behavior that quite possibly will change which is that we might see uh, the rest of Europe slipping back a little bit from some of their openness on trade. Now, I know my colleagues say it's not perfectly open. It is not perfectly open, but Europe is relatively open. What would it mean so far as behavior for the British um, government, British economy is concerned? Well, it may be 
that we will see a more liberal, a more active, a more imaginative sort of trade policy emerging from Europe. We have created the post of Secretary of State for International Trade. Uh, the poor man has nothing to do at the moment because he doesn't own trade policy. The EU owns it until we've actually left. Uh, so he's doubtless dreaming up all sorts of grand ideas, and it's just possible we'll see the Brits out trying to negotiate uh, free trade agreements with, say, China or India, if the Indians could ever bring themselves uh, to the table. Um, will Britain be more liberal itself? I, it's possible, but I wouldn't want to bet on it. The first reason is that the majority of people who voted for Brexit were essentially casting an anti-globalization vote. Very, very difficult to get out there and sell them huge liberalism if that's actually what they thought they were going to avoid. Um, secondly, uh, Britain has got to negotiate a whole pile of free trade agreements. And when you go into a, sort of a bidding match, the thing you don't do is empty your pockets before you go into the room and have nothing to ne negotiate with. In other words, you know, Britain is very proud of the fact, uh, absurdly I think, but very proud of the fact that it's the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. But if you are the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world, you have some negotiating leverage. And so I don't think the British government is going to give that away unilaterally. The third reason to worry about whether Britain is going to be very liberal is um, we, uh, we have already, and it's going to get worse, essentially a public finance crisis. And the idea that the Treasury is going to give up some taxes voluntarily, even if uh, the Department for International Trade wants them to, is not hugely plausible. So my prediction, and this is entirely you know, a prediction, is don't expect uh, the British uh, to be uh, very liberal. Now, you know, all of those things, as I said, if we're careful, we can live with. The system can live with. Uh, what if we're not careful? What's the issue that uh, might uh, sort of emerge if we have a lot of uh, diplomatic bombasticness, uh, we have some carelessness, some bloody-mindedness on either the British side or in the other side. And that is that the, it's just possible that unwinding the UK position from the EU position basically calls into question or disrupts entirely uh, the regular business of uh, the World Trade Organization. And one of the things which I think other people in the WTO should be thinking about is how you are going to cope with this, or perhaps how you can head it off. Um, the sort of process that we've got is that the, the UK is a member of the World Trade Organization, no doubt about that. It has a schedule. It happens to be headed up EU at the moment. And what we need to do is essentially to uh, bring that schedule uh, to a position where it's headed up United Kingdom. Um, a number of my colleagues argue that they can do this through a process in the WTO, which is known as rectification. And this is the sort of day-by-day -day changes uh, to tariff schedules that go on all the time. You notice something wrong with them. You say, we never expected that this is what we had agreed to, or you didn't expect that this is what we had agreed to. We will change it. A rectification involves an announcement of a change, and then providing nobody challenges it within three months, it is essentially agreed. If Britain were to impose exactly the same set of tariffs as it currently charges with the EU, uh, maybe that would be a rectification, maybe nobody would challenge, and maybe the UK would emerge with a proper, uh, respectable uh, tariff um, schedule. Sounds perfectly straightforward. but well, it's not quite as straightforward as that. The essential point is that if Britain is in a free trade area with the uh, European Union, suddenly between Britain and the other members, the EU27, there will be a border with rules of origin because free trade areas require you to prove origin and that's what we would have to do. And so in fact, um, we, we are going to disrupt trade within Europe, sort of trade from third countries within Europe in two particular ways. One perfectly easy to conceptualize, and that's the so-called Rotterdam effect. At present, Kenya sells its flowers into Rotterdam. They're then transshipped to Britain. 
put a border in the way, put some inspections in the way, a little bit of lack of cooperation, and you're immediately faced with extra costs, possible delays, uh, possibly obstructionism. Uh, we could probably get around that. You could probably negotiate something special for flowers, but it's work, it's uncertainty. But there's also a much more uh, a potentially um, a more important issue, and that goes back to the global value chains uh, that um, uh, Faisal has mentioned. Uh, rules of origin typically require that a particular proportion of the value of a good be created in terms of local, uh, local output. Within the EU, um, so, so when, we, when we get into that situation, British inputs incorporated into the EU products will not count as EU uh, inputs, and therefore the EU might lose its access to other countries where it has a free trade agreement. The, that country's rule of origin says 60% of the input must be EU, well, maybe that was split 55% on the continent and 10% in Britain. All right, take the Brits out, the EU has lost its access. Exactly the same uh, for Britain. When these things come up, I mean, they're irritating. Uh, they will be difficult and messy to manage because they're in detail. But essentially, they raise the prospect that other members of the WTO will say, no, no, just changing the label on the same tariff schedule from EU to UK, so we've now got two schedules rather than one, does not leave our WTO rights unaffected. Indeed, it is to our disadvantage. And frankly, we think you, the Brits, or you, the European Union, need to be reducing your tariffs in compensation. We want a, an Article 28 uh, renegotiation. Uh, that's a fine and dandy, 162 mem uh, 63 members of the WTO. Britain has got 40 trade negotiators at the moment. Where is that going to go? It's going to be a real mess. Exactly the same issues, actually, pertain to uh, developing countries. Uh, think about a country, uh, at the moment, uh, you can import a good into the UK under GSP, you can build it into something else and flog the thing in Europe, no tariffs, no inspections, no nothing, it's fine. But now put a border in the way, you can bring the same good into Britain, you can build it into the same final good, and then you can take it to Europe to sell. Well, you've got a rule of origin to face, and you've also potentially got a standards issue to face, because the UK will no longer be part of the single market, it will no longer be bound to enforce exactly the same standards, and at the minimum, the European authorities will have the right to ask on the border, is this of a suitable standard? Uh, uncertainty, and so on. So for developing countries even, uh, with GSP access, just dividing the two markets, changing no tariffs, no preference margin, anything, does not leave everything exactly the same. Two other gritty little problems that have been observed um, uh, prior to Brexit, actually, uh, by the Cognoscenti, is that there are a number of things where the EU has a single right, as it were, in the WTO, and it has to be disaggregated. One is the tariff rate quotas on agricultural products, where uh, the EU uh, had negotiated a single tariff rate quota, or a lower tariff on a particular volume of imports for the EU as a whole. You've got to break that up. And it really matters, or potentially it really matters, how you break it up. Imagine at the moment a lot of imports are going into the EU, most of them from a developing country, shall we say, most of them get the low tariff because they're within the tariff, uh, the tariff rate quota. Now suppose the EU and its great generation gives the whole of that tariff rate quota to the UK, our country doesn't export to the UK, but all its exports into the EU now face the higher tariff. So. Britain and the UK have got to, sorry, Britain and Europe have got to work that out in a way that doesn't irritate too many people so there are not too many complaints. The third area is um, the um, uh, right to agricultural subsidies, which is limited by the aggregate measure of support, the AMS. We, uh, we've got to break it up. Now, all of these things are nasty, gritty, and uh, I think, to be honest, no one is thinking about them very much. They're not a death sentence on the system because the WTO is a very, very pragmatic organization. It's not terribly hung up about legal legalities. Uh, for instance, with the aggregate measure of support, when the European Union enlarged in 2004 and 2007, 
The EU declared that because it was now larger, its right to agricultural subsidies, its AMS, had gone up, and it told its partners in the WTO that it thought this was the case. Nobody said anything. It's neither been accepted nor rejected, but trade goes on. So in a sense, getting all the legalities in place is not necessary for trade to go on. But that presupposes that we all think we're on the same side, that no one thinks they're getting a rum deal from this. So it seems to me that forgetting about where Britain might be as the champion of a liberal order 20 years from now, um, we can't really see two, <coughs> three, four years ahead. But over the next two, three or four years, there is a massive diplomatic job to be done. Most of that resides in London. I won't tell you what I think of diplomats in London, but anyway, it resides in London. You just have that. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> Me and my mouth. Uh, uh, you know, quite a lot of it, I guess, resides in Brussels, but a bit resides in other capitals. And so, in a sense, the constructive message to take home is to every government, every member of the WTO, you know, we need to spend 10 minutes thinking about this. We need to decide, are we going to be very cooperative or are we going to exploit this? a little bit of disruption with a view to getting an extra concession or two. But don't underestimate how destructive that could be to the fabric of the WTO unless you find a way of insulating the system from it. Thank you very much, Alan.